There is nothing more tantalizing to the human species than a good mystery. Thrillers in the forms of novels, movies, and even campfire tales are often consumed by the thousands who love the adrenaline rush of solving a mystery. However, some of the most pervasive mysteries are those that occur in real life, and these are the ones that are often most difficult to solve. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at mysterious discoveries. The Tunguska Event Russia is known for being a powerhouse and being home to some of the greatest nuclear power on the planet, but this power has caused various issues for the country. One interesting case happened back in 1908. On the morning of the 30th of June 1908, a large explosion occurred near the Tunguska River. This terrifying explosion over the hardly populated region of eastern Siberia erased around 80 million trees. Whatever this explosion was ripped through the area with ease and caused a massive amount of damage. The large majority of the trees have been wiped of its branches. It's also said that around three people died in the event. When it comes to the reason behind this famous incident, various theories have been put forward, the majority of which people can't seem to agree on. One of the most accepted theories is that a meteorite caused the destruction of the area. Interestingly, Scientists and researchers have classified this as an impact event, even though no impact crater or objects have ever been discovered, something that's led people to look at alternative theories to explain the mysterious event. Scientists, however, have stuck to the meteorite story and say that the object that caused the damage would have been large. They suggested that the object disintegrated at around 5 to 12 miles in the sky. Back in 1908 when this incident happened, science was not at the level it is now. Due to this, researchers at the time had limited instruments. The magnitude of the event has helped modern researchers to come to a more conclusive answer for what happened here. As it took around 10 to 11 years to find out information on this incident, and because many people living in the area were religious, they concluded that the reason this event happened was because their god was not happy with them. Science has said that various studies have allowed them to come up with different estimates of the size of the meteorite, ranging from 50 to 190 meters, depending on how fast the body was traveling. Along with the size of the meteorite, other factors were also measured in order to reach a decision. Tests showed that the energy of this object would have been the same as 3 to 30 megatons of TNT. More than a hundred years after the event, only a few clues remain. For such a large event, it's left behind no clue whatsoever. Interestingly, researchers have said that much larger events happened in Earth's history, but this event is considered one of the largest impact events ever recorded in the history of the Earth. Today, after more than 100 years of the event, scientists still believe there is something we are missing. One NASA scientist said the following about the event. A century later, some still debate the cause and come up with different scenarios that could have caused the explosion. But the generally agreed upon theory is that on the morning of June the 30th, 1908, a large space rock about 120 feet across entered the atmosphere of Siberia and then detonated in the sky. Stephen Kubacki It's the winter of 1978 in the American Midwest and Stephen Kubacki, a student from Hope College, is taking advantage of the last days of February before spring began to go skiing. He leaves his student digs to go on a solo cross-country skiing trip. Kubacki was an accomplished outdoorsman who climbed mountains in Europe and was an avid cross-country skier. Familiar with the area, this was an ordinary weekend pursuit for Kubacki and to those at college who knew him. However, this small excursion would end up being far from ordinary. Several days later, the alarm was raised when Kubaki failed to return from what should have been a day's activity. At the same time, snowmobilers on the southeastern shore of Lake Michigan had come across a set of abandoned skis and ski poles. The police knew immediately who they belonged to. A search party was sent out, utilizing both land and air rescue, with helicopters and locals deployed to find Stephen. Only two more things were subsequently discovered. Stephen's backpack and his footprints in the deep, frozen snow. 
There was something off about the scene, however. The backpack looked as if it had been abruptly thrown to the ground, and the heavy footprints disappeared into nothingness as if Kubaki had walked out of reality. Looking to close off the case with a sense of logic, police figured a more rational explanation. Close to the shores of frozen Lake Michigan, Stephen must have removed his skis and wandered too close to the water, falling through the ice and drowning into the watery depths below. His friends grieved, his family mourned, and life returned to normal as the months passed by. That is, until 15 months later, Stephen Kubiaki walked straight through the door of his family house over 500 miles away. Stephen told his recollection of events as best he could. That day, May 5th, 1979, he woke up on a grassy knoll in Massachusetts, some 700 miles due east from where he disappeared. He was wearing clothes that were not his, had items such as maps and signs that were neither his nor written by him, and he had no concept of the amount of time that had passed. It was only when he was able to purchase a newspaper he would realize that he had re-emerged to consciousness 15 months later than when he first set off. The last thing he remembered before this was striding forwards on his skis as he made his way around Lake Michigan. Before he knew it, however, he experienced a momentary blip, being enveloped in a cold and frozen darkness that hurried him from one point to another which felt like he was running. Aside from this, he had no other details to give, and yet the mystery of what happened that day in February 1978 was perhaps less about Kubaki and more about where he was. Urban myths run rife that Lake Michigan is home to cross-dimensional disappearances, essentially the Bermuda Triangle of the Great Lakes. It's not just Kubaki who went missing in this area. Ships, planes and other people have all disappeared and for whom there was never any trace of again. As of today, Kubaki's disappearance and reappearance remains a mystery. The Man Left Ashore September 8, 1863. A man was found ashore on the beach of Sandy Cove with both his legs amputated. The man was taken in by the local Acadians who gave him the name Jerome. He was mute. The locals helped him out of Christian charity, but due to the lack of communication and his severe disability, all his decisions were made for him, and he was unable to speak for himself. Jerome lived for 42 years with the Dedier Comiao family. Sir Beth Dedier took care of him and nursed him, and he became an honorary member of their family even watching the Komiao children grow up. His life with them was simple for his amputation made it impossible for him to be independent or to do manual work most men did. He would wake up, stare out the window or go into the sun in the summer and eat meals with the family and sleep. Jerome passed away in 1912 and was buried in the Catholic cemetery of Metigen along St. Mary's Bay in Nova Scotia. Decades passed and various individuals claimed they knew who Jerome was. Many believed the man to be Italian, perhaps a mutilated nobleman who kept his silence to save himself from political rivals. Another theory was that he was an Italian naval officer, injured on board and cruelly abandoned by his crewmates. Those who cared for him claimed he would sometimes utter Colombo and Trieste, further proving that he was Italian. Some, however, believed him to be Jeremiah Mahoney, an Irish immigrant who emigrated from Ireland to escape his family. Theories were abundant. Another theory claimed him to be Gamby the Frozen Man. Gamby was found in 1859 on a logging trail in New Brunswick and cared for in the parish of Chipman. His legs were amputated due to gangrene in the spring of 1861. The taxpayers of the village paid to have the man removed in 1863 because caring for him was too expensive. They believed Gamby to be Italian. The sequence of events and similarities in the story makes many people believe Gamby and Jerome to be the same person. Jerome never spoke enough to reveal the truth about himself. The Shanti Devi Story the story of Shanti Devi is among the most amazing documentation of reincarnation attracting the attention of everyone, including Mahatma Gandhi. Born in India's New Delhi on the 11th of December 1926, Shanti did not speak much in her first years, unlike many young children.
When she reached four years, however, she started speaking about her memories of another life that she lived. She said that her home was not in Delhi, but instead 93 miles away in Mathura, where she lived with her husband, and she insisted that she had to go back to her son and husband. Her parents discouraged her from speaking of her previous life, telling her to put it behind her and be concerned about the present, which annoyed her and made her run away from home to Mathura. She was found and taken back to her parents. She started speaking of her previous life during school in detail and was even able to recall the names of her husband, children and what happened when she lost her life. She died nine days after giving birth. This information enabled the headmaster to locate a man named Kedar Nath, who had lost his wife Ludji nine years ago, ten days after childbirth. Kedar visited Shanti and her parents using a false name and she soon identified him as her previous life husband. Mahatma Gandhi was informed of the events and possible reincarnation and he set up a team to investigate the story. Shanti and the team went to Mathura where she recognized her home, the furniture layout and even her family members. She remembered some secrets of family members that someone would only know in confidence. Shanti was also able to tell her husband that he did not keep the promises that he had made to her. She also started speaking in her local dialect. The team concluded irrefutably that Shanti Devi was a reincarnation of Lugdi Devi. Several other researchers did their independent investigations and came to the same conclusion. The Firefighter and the Ghost From the native Indians who settled on the plains to the unstoppable machine that was westward expansion, states such as Indiana have a rich history. Whilst aesthetically stunning, some consider Indiana rightly or wrongly to be a little, well, forgotten. Although this assumption is not exactly true, something that is undisputable is that the state has had its fair share of terrifying supernatural encounters. Much of the superstition in Indiana is based on folklore, and in the town of Gary, a belief in the paranormal perhaps now runs a little deeper after a spine-chilling event that took place in 2015. An abandoned and dilapidated town, Gary's population is small and crime rates are high. As such, old buildings are prone to setting ablaze, and the city's fire brigade are often busy. But one call out to battle a small wooden shack that had caught fire was one that the firefighter in question will likely never forget. After taking a few photographs of the blaze for training purposes before posting the pictures on Facebook, the firefighter's family spotted something strange in the window of the fiery abode. Standing in the flames was the horrifying figure of a man dressed in black. The bizarre thing was that the house was known to be long empty, and the firefighters had not heard any signs of distress coming from the building as they put out the fire. As such, residents of Gary came to the only conclusion that they thought fitted the strange event, that the malevolent man in black could only be something from another world namely a ghost or spirit of some sort. Of course, this cannot be verified, but in a town that has been largely abandoned, even the strangest things are not out of the realms of possibility. The Disappearance of the Flannan Lighthouse Keepers As a lighthouse keeper, work can be dangerous, and in emergency situations, help is often too far away. This appeared to be the case when three workers, James Ducat, Thomas Marshall and Donald MacArthur, sent shockwaves around the world with their sudden disappearance from Flannan Lighthouse. The disappearance was brought to light when a ship called Hesperus set sail for Eileen Moor. As previously planned, Captain James Harvey was delivering a relief lighthouse keeper to Flannan Lighthouse. However, on arrival at the lighthouse, he realised something strange was going on. The flagstaff had no flag, all the provision boxes had been left on the landing and none of the three lighthouse keepers were there to welcome the ship. Even when Harvey sounded a whistle and shot a flare to try to catch the lighthouse keeper's attention, the island remained silent. A sailor, Joseph Moore, was sent on a boat to investigate further. According to reports, he experienced a sense of foreboding coming up to the lighthouse. When he arrived, he found the entrance gate and main door closed, beds unmade, clocks stopped, and no sign of the lighthouse keepers in the lighthouse or on the island. 
Moore reported this back to Harvey, who immediately sent a telegram to the Northern Lighthouse Board, stating that a dreadful accident had happened at the Flannans, where three keepers, Ducat, Marshall, and the Occasional have disappeared from the island. Robert Muirhead, a Northern Lighthouse Board superintendent, was tasked with setting up an official investigation into the incident. On arriving, Muirhead focused closely on the ropes strung along the island. From this, he theorized that in the middle of a storm, the men had gone down to the rocks to secure a box in which the mooring and landing ropes were kept and while doing so had been swept away. Muirhead's theory that water took out the three lighthouse keepers seems credible. Firstly, looking at the geography of Eileen Moor, the caves on the west would have been flooded by water in high seas or storms, and this water would then explode out with considerable force and cause the type of wall of water that could have swept the three lighthouse keepers away. Alternatively, a storm could have washed the men away. The island was known to have experienced its share of storms. Ducat had experienced his dislike of the dangerous weather to his family before, and the construction of the lighthouse took two years longer than planned due to delays caused by rough seas and harsh weather. On the island, there was evidence of recent storms as the iron railings of the trolley tramway had broken in several places and the box containing the ropes had vanished, despite having been firmly anchored into a crevice. One thing Muirhead could not explain was why three experienced lighthouse keepers would risk going out in stormy weather conditions. This question was answered when James Love's research on the mysterious case unveiled that Marshall had previously been fined five shillings for equipment that had been washed away in a gale. Love used this fresh piece of evidence to strengthen Muirhead's theory. It was the fear of having another fine imposed for washed away equipment that led the men to leave the lighthouse and go to the rocks. Love argues that MacArthur had stayed in the lighthouse, but seeing danger approach the other two keepers, had rushed out without his coat to warn them, before also being swept away. With Love's modifications, Muirhead's theory sounds plausible. However, it still could not answer why Moore found the entrance gate and main door closed when arriving at the lighthouse. If the three lighthouse keepers were in a rush, they surely wouldn't have had time to lock up the lighthouse, particularly if they thought they would soon be returning. The theory also fails to explain the log entries supposedly written by the three missing lighthouse keepers. These log entries hint that unusual events were taking place before their disappearance. Marshall writes of severe winds the likes of which I have never seen before in 20 years. That's left Ducat very quiet and MacArthur crying. Given the men's experience in marine work and MacArthur's reputation for brawling, this behavior seems out of character. Log entries on the 13th of December mention a raging storm that left all three men praying, which is puzzling as they would have known they were safe in a secure lighthouse structure far above sea level. Even stranger is that no storms were recorded during these dates. This has led some to believe paranormal activity was taking place on the island. Eileen Moore has a history of unsettling accounts. Its chapel was said to move even the most non-religious person to worship and rituals, such as circling the building on your knees. Herders would never dare allow their sheep to graze overnight because they believed the land to be haunted and there were tales of sightings of strange creatures such as giant birds and little men. Some say that this paranormal atmosphere might have led the three light keepers to madness. MacArthur, known to be a volatile man, might have been sent over the edge and murdered the other two lighthouse keepers, and then taken his own life. Or the three men might have decided to flee the island and seek greener pastures. We already know how unhappy Ducat was to be living in the lighthouse from his correspondence with home. Despite nationwide speculation, there is still no perfect solution to answer what happened to the three lighthouse keepers who disappeared on Eileen Moor. Mystery Airships, 1896-1897 Almost a decade before the Wright brothers' first flight, Numerous sightings of strange, cigar-shaped UFOs were spotted across the United States. Starting in 1896 and continuing to 1897, 
These mystery airships were bigger and faster than anything else known at that time. The first sighting was reported in the winter of 1896. A light was seen slowly moving through the Sacramento night sky on November 17th, with otherworldly sounds being heard as it passed overhead. The mystery light reappeared on the evening of November 21st, and then subsequently seen over more than half a dozen cities including San Francisco and Oakland and viewed by hundreds of witnesses. Not long after, more unidentified airships would be seen. On the outskirts of Springfield, Missouri, one was seen having crash-landed to the ground. It was 20 feet in length, 8 feet in diameter and propelled by three giant propellers. An on-the-spot witness approached the ship and came across its two pilots. They looked human. However, their language was nothing of this world. They attempted with difficulty to communicate, trying to ascertain the pilot's origins. Eventually, they both pointed upwards and apparently uttered something that sounded like the word Mars, before quickly returning to their airship and launching high into the sky, leaving witnesses completely mystified below. These unidentified objects would also be the first reported stories of alien abduction. The first occurred in April 1897 and involved another mystery airship hovering over a farmer's cattle pen. Upon closer examination, onlookers realized that a cable from the airship had roped up a cow, but was struggling to break free, having become entangled in the pen's fence. The group unsuccessfully tried to free the cow, but the fence itself was torn out of the ground, leaving the ship, cow, and part of the fence all rising slowly into the air and sail off into the sky. Interestingly enough, the airships weren't just after livestock, they tried to take people as well. It was on November the 19th, 1896, two days after the first mystery airship sighting over Sacramento. A US Colonel, H.G. Shaw, was driving his buggy through the countryside near Stockton when he came across what appeared to be a landed airship. Shaw described it as having pointed ends and a silver exterior without any features aside from a rudder for steering. The ship was about 150 feet end-to-end, -end, 25 foot in diameter. Suddenly, to Colonel Shaw's amazement, three slender, seven-foot-tall extraterrestrials exited the craft, all emitting a strange warbling noise. The beings reportedly examined Shaw's buggy before attending to Shaw himself, deciding to physically force him into their craft. Luckily, the stocky, well-built soldier was physically superior to the thin, lanky beings, and the aliens soon gave up, fleeing back to their ship and quickly speeding out of sight, leaving Colonel Shaw baffled below. Disappearance of Ravel Balmain Last seen in 1994, Ravel was a 22-year-old professional dancer and model. She led a double life, however that she kept hidden from her closest friends and family. Ravel was also a casual escort, but according to some reports, Ravel had started doing this in order to save money for a trip to Japan that would further her professional dancing career. The last person believed to see Ravel alive was Gavin Samer. He claims that he had won $150 at a casino that night, which he decided to spend on a woman. When he called the agency that Ravel worked for, he gave a fake name. Thankfully, the agent did its due diligence at that point and noticed that the name Gavin gave was not the name his phone was registered to. When they called him back and told him what they found, he conceded and gave his real name. Gavin Samer claimed to have had a girlfriend at the time, which may have been his reason for giving a fake name. Samer claims after their appointment, he drove Ravel to the Red Tomato Inn and left her there. There are no witnesses to corroborate this. Around this location, Ravel's last known location, her makeup bag, keys and one shoe was found. Ravel's body has not been recovered. Samer remains the number one person of interest in the case, a fact that he is straightforward with when he is interviewed. Samer spent about 15 years living in Tasmania as a recluse, until 2018 when he pleaded guilty to old theft charges. Strangely, years later, another person close to Samer suffered a sudden death. In April of 2020, he was arrested for assaulting his former roommate. He was accused of committing violation offences against her will, but the charges were dropped when she passed away tragically in an explosion in her apartment. Though this does not prove motive, it does seem too strange to be a coincidence. In May of 2021, 
The family announced a $1 million reward for anyone with information that would lead to the discovery of Ravel's remains. Mary Curie's remains were not found for 60 years. Ravel's family hoped to have some closure before then. They have already waited 26 years in the dark, and sadly both of her parents passed away without ever finding out what happened to their daughter. The Pensioner Who Vanished James Pruitt, a 70-year-old resident of the sunny state of Tennessee, was reported missing from the Rocky Mountain National Park in early March 2019. Alarm bells were first raised when his car was found desolate at the Glacier George Trailhead on the early morning of March 3rd. Upon further investigation, rangers uncovered that Pruitt had not been in contact with his family for several days before his disappearance, since February 28th as a matter of fact. Naturally, this confirmed the rangers' suspicions and search efforts got underway swiftly later that day. However, as always seems to happen in these situations, the odds were against the search party from the off. The park had been smothered in two feet of snow just days before Pruitt's disappearance was reported, and coupled with the rocky terrain, it was becoming evident that finding Pruitt was going to be no easy feat. For six days, between March 3rd and March 8th, an extensive search was conducted. Rangers trawled the park and a variety of specialized teams were also deployed utilizing dogs and even aerial reconnaissance. The search encompassed 15 square miles of lakes, glaciers and gorges, yet James Pruitt was still nowhere to be found. Owing to the persistent bad weather, search efforts were called off in mid-March, although the story does not just end here. During the summer, efforts were revitalized and focused on more specific areas, and there was also more hope this time as the summer was a busy time with over 2 million people flocking to the park each year to bask in its secluded beauty. This meant that with streams of visitors also traversing the park, it was much more likely that someone was going to stumble on a clue, perhaps one of his belongings or even Pruitt himself. But unfortunately, the series of attempts that took place over the summer yielded no clues nor results and efforts tapered off. At this point, you would be forgiven for thinking that any chance of Pruitt being found were long gone. However, in October, a new search began, albeit with a different tactic. Instead of focused searches in popular parts of the park, efforts were concentrated in off-trail areas. It was hoped that, as visitors were less common there, clues linked to Pruitt could still be awaiting discovery, and any tracks he may have left could still be intact. Ultimately, the search was unsuccessful, but it demonstrated the resilience of the search teams. In a final blow to any hopes of finding Pruitt alive, the park's public information officer, Kyle Patterson, confirmed that no active searches would be taking place as of the 26th of November 2019, instead relying on members of the public to report anything they think might be relevant. As of 2021, Mr. Pruitt is still considered missing, with the occasional Facebook post reminding the public to keep their eyes peeled for clues. With that said, any hope of uncovering the truth of his untimely demise has long been extinguished. Antarctica Mysterious Humming Noise Antarctica is shrouded in mystery. It's known for its harsh climate and beautiful wildlife. Each year, research is carried out on the continent and experiments are conducted. The Ross Ice Shelf is the largest ice shelf of Antarctica. It's the world's largest piece of floating ice and can be seen in the Southern Ocean in line with the mainland. For many years now, research has been carried out to get a better idea of its physical properties. Scientists had placed over 30 extremely sensitive seismic sensors under its snowy surface to monitor vibrations between 2014 and 2017, but something was picked up that left them looking for answers. Testimonies and video footage show that a mysterious humming sound can be heard. This noise was created by the structure itself. It was confusing, however, because there was nothing around that could be giving off these noises. After all, these sensors were embedded inside thick blankets of snow. Researchers in the region have suggested it could be the ice sheet that's creating the mysterious hum. However, as of today, the noise remains a mystery.
Linda Artiega. A 53-year-old woman by the name of Linda Artiega disappeared in the thick, ruthless, and unkind woods of Arkansas, where the elements reigned supreme. The situation was so dire that the emergency officials declared it to be a search and recover mission, as opposed to the usual search and rescue, proving that they didn't believe they would find the woman alive after she had been missing for days in the dangerous wilderness. Linda Artiega's niece, Shelley, worried night and day for her aunt's safety. Though hope seemed lost with the knowledge that survival chances in such a dangerous place were low. There were moments when Shelley believed they wouldn't find her aunt alive, stating, you understood they were looking for a body, not a survivor, and that's what we were kind of expecting. After several days of futile searching past without a single trace of Linda, a volunteer found her vehicle in a place close. It came to light that Linda Artiega had been out hiking with her brother, aged 56, Eddie Huff. The two had gotten lost in the wilderness and were not able to find their way back to civilization. The two ended up unfortunately separated, with Huff finding a way out of the woods only two days after their hike, but Linda dwelled in the wild for far longer. Huff was the one who alerted Shelley about the trip and how they had gotten lost and separated, but mistakenly thought he had seen his sister sitting on the porch of a family member's house. It was only after four days that Shelley and Huff realized something was wrong, when Linda hadn't been seen since the hike. It took five days for the searching party to even set out, 120 hours in which Linda was helplessly alone in the woods. 120 hours in which anything could have happened to her. 75 volunteers set out to search, on both foot, horseback, and in vehicles. Miraculously, she found a way to survive. She had lost her flip-flops and had to walk barefoot for the majority of her desperate attempt at survival. Fortunately, she managed to sustain herself of watercress, nuts, and berries she found, as well as quenching her thirst from a creek. After she was rescued, doctors suspected that berries eaten by both Huff and Linda might have been toxic and caused paranoia and confusion in them both, thus making them susceptible to getting lost and splitting up. Dehydration and toxins in the berries may have caused Huff to hallucinate seeing Linda on the porch that day, thus making him believe she was safe for those precious extra hours that could have been used to look for her. Linda had quite an intriguing story to tell. She claimed to have had an experience with the legendary shadow people, though the concept of her hallucinating has to be considered. When she was found in the deep woodland, the woman was unnerved and paranoid. Both siblings had memory loss when it came to the events of their hike. She explained that, as far as she recalled, Huff had gotten injured and she tried to find help. As she wandered through the woods, she found more hikers, but they didn't hear her calling out to them. As the days and nights passed, she swore she saw shadow figures observing her from the trees, bushes, and crevices in the woods. She claims that the next thing she remembers is the volunteer search party calling her name. Janine Vaughan Disappearance Another story that families are hoping will be brought back into the spotlight is the story of Janine Vaughan. Janine was last seen on December 7, 2001, at 4 a.m., where CCTV footage shows her on Keppel Street, Bathurst. The security footage shows her getting into the front passenger seat of a bright red four-door medium-sized sedan. Police interviewed over 1,000 people in the investigation of Janine's disappearance until 2003, when she was presumed deceased. Among those investigated for her disappearance was a local policeman, Brad Hoseman. The Police Integrity Commission did not release their findings for some time. However, Brad was forced to leave the force with no retirement benefits. Around the time of Janine's disappearance, Brad told the police that he was staying with his mother near Newcastle. However, he changed his story when he was investigated by the Police Integrity Commission, admitting that he had been in Bathurst. In 2009, the coroner who had taken the case recreated what was last known of Janine's movements on the day she went missing. He walked along the street, dimming the streetlights to make the recreation as real as possible. During this time, Brad Hoseman was brought up once again. 
Friends of Vaughan had claimed that Hoseman would often walk by the shop where she worked and wave to her while she was inside. According to her friends, she had expressed concerns about Hoseman's actions seeming a little like stalking, but nothing was taken too seriously and no paperwork was ever filed in the matter. Vaughan's former boyfriend of five years recalled that she did complain about notes, flowers and even lingerie being left on her car while she was at work. Is it a coincidence that Hoseman knew where she worked and purposely walked by to wave to her often? Did he have any reason to be walking by and seeking her out in the window? Was it because he was on his way to her car to leave small tokens and gifts? We can only speculate as no one has come forward with information about the matter. We can only hope that technology and science progresses in such a way that allows us to find out what happened to these women after so many years. The people who may have information on any of these cases are aging, and their memories are as well. We can only hope for their families that someone can give them peace sooner rather than later. The Valley Hill Lights Valley Hill Lights is located in the picturesque Springfield in Kentucky. Springfield is generally known for its babbling brooks, tall trees and blue skies. However, if one were to travel down Route 55, you would approach the valley which is renowned for something far more substantial than scenic views. In April 1995, eight young girls and their Catholic education teacher had several religious sightings alongside random visions of bursts of colour and showers of golden flakes. One of the students, Mandy Mattingly, described seeing an array of colours around a pulsating sun. The other girls described seeing gold colours appearing on their flesh, which their teacher photographed. When these pictures were developed, the teacher and students were shocked to see angels surrounding the lights and in one image Jesus and the Virgin Mary in a veil. One of the students, Sabrina Ballard, said she could see the name of her deceased cousin. Kate Ballard on a tombstone in the background of one of the photographs. Amanda Terrell was another of the eight girls and still to this day credits the events of that day for giving her more of a spiritual background and making her feel closer to God. Terrell is not the only one. At its peak of popularity, scores of people travelled to the valley and described how the experience drew them closer to God. Hazel Spaulding is one of these visitors and describes how she knew that the place held special powers from above, as the rosary she was holding turned gold and she could suddenly smell roses without there being any rose bush in sight. Angel Wimsat supports her by describing how you know something is going on in the very special valley. Notably, there are individuals who are not convinced of the authenticity of the visions. Dr. Joe Nickel managed to get his hands on the original photographs taken by the teacher of the eight schoolgirls and argues that the most likely explanation for the images of angels were due to a cartridge leak and that the image of Jesus and the Virgin Mary was a result of pareidolia, a psychological phenomenon that causes people to see patterns in a random stimulus. The inscription of Ballard's late cousin's name in the tombstone, Nickel argues, is actually an imprint from the back of the Polaroid photo pack. Despite skeptics like Nickel, many continue to travel to the valley in a bid to glimpse a vision of the Virgin Mary. Benjamin Briggs, Mary Celeste The mystery of the Mary Celeste has been speculated upon for almost three centuries. In 1872, the Mary Celeste was uncovered on the coast of Portugal, entirely devoid of any signs of life from the crew which once boarded it. Among the missing crew was Benjamin Briggs, the ship's captain and master mariner. The ship was still under sail and in almost pristine condition despite one lifeboat missing and no men on board. Sarah Briggs, Benjamin's wife and their two-year-old daughter, Sophia, disappeared along with him, all presumed to have passed away. The Briggs bloodline carried the maritime passion in its veins. The ocean was Benjamin's whole world, which shaped him into an experienced sailor who knew the dangers of the sea, often sailing together with his brother, Oliver Briggs. The master mariner was heavily faithful to God and married Sarah, the daughter of a reverend, in 1862. Together they sailed all over Europe and had two children, including their eldest son, Arthur Briggs. Oliver and Benjamin planned on purchasing a hardware store in New Bedford, and giving up their sea legs, but in 1872, 
Benjamin bought a share in James Winchester's Mary Celeste, a merchant ship, and decided to do one last voyage before giving up their marine passion for good. It is tragically ironic that this was to be his final journey. Benjamin and Sarah's son, Arthur, survived, having been at his grandmother's during the time of the voyage, and the Briggs have living relatives. We will never know what fate became of these great explorers. Despite the pessimistic nature of their disappearances, the missing rowboat on the Mary Celeste leaves the hope that the crew, and if not at least the Briggs family, survived and settled elsewhere. Perhaps the Corte Real brothers let go of their noble bloodline and chose to live amongst the natives of Labrador. Maybe Roald Amundsen found something extraordinary and unimaginable in the skies as he flew over the Arctic, or perhaps they simply perished in the dangerous circumstances of their journeys. Whatever your theory may be, it changes not the fact that we may never truly get the satisfaction of uncovering what happened to these great men, but we can keep their memory and achievements alive. Bruce Pike Disappearance Bruce Pike disappeared in Yellowstone National Park on August 2, 2006. The disappearance of Bruce Pike is perhaps the most mysterious disappearance. Very little is known of Pike with seldom information released to the public regarding who he was and how he went missing. Yellowstone is one of the most famous and most frequently visited national parks in the continental United States. It receives an estimated 4 million visitors annually and that number only seems to increase with every passing year. Every single day, there is likely to be about 11,000 people in the park at any given time. Holding its spot at number one, it is the world's first national park and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. With the enormous landscape stretching over 2 million acres, it is common for tourists to find themselves lost or to wander off their original path. However, these people are almost always found within a few days or even hours, as the park is so heavily trafficked. Only three people have ever been lost to be never found in Yellowstone National Park. Bruce Pike just happened to be one of them. What we know was Pike was last seen at the Indian Creek campground on August 2, 2006. His car was found to be abandoned nearby. His story was not covered by the media and there is no public record of any family members asking for help to find him. Despite the seeming lack of interest, mysteriously enough, the Texas authorities are participating in an ongoing investigation of his disappearance. He has never been seen or heard of since. But what do you make of these mysteries and disappearances? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and help us by growing this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.